Mystery land buyers around California Air Force Base revealed. A mysterious company named Flannery Associates has invested over $800 million in purchasing nearly 54,000 acres of land near the Travis Air Force Base in Solano County, California, raising concerns about national security. Initial speculation pointed to China's involvement, but the company's legal representation claims it is controlled by U.S. citizens, with the majority of its capital coming from U.S.-based investors. However, federal officials were unable to confirm this information after eight months of investigation. Recent reports reveal that Flannery Associates is composed of wealthy Silicon Valley investors aiming to create a new urban center northeast of San Francisco. Catering to the needs of the tech industry and addressing congestion and housing challenges. This project is under scrutiny due to its proximity to the Travis Air Force Base, with concerns about national security and foreign investment. The Air Force's Foreign Investment Risk Review Office is investigating the matter, and Democratic California Representative John Garamendi highlighted potential threats to the airbase's security. The company's aggressive land acquisition tactics have led to legal battles with local farmers who sold their land under pressure, and Flannery is now suing them for conspiring to inflate land values. U.S. judge cancels hearing on Mexican suit against gunmakers, Mexico says. A U.S. judge has postponed a hearing for Mexico's $10 billion lawsuit against U.S. gun manufacturers, which seeks to hold them responsible for aiding arms trafficking to drug cartels. Mexico's foreign ministry had been pushing for the case to proceed, but the hearing scheduled for Monday was cancelled by Judge Cindy Jorgensen, who is considering recusing herself from the case. The lawsuit targets U.S. gun manufacturers over their alleged role in providing firearms to Mexican drug cartels. Around 70% of crime guns recovered and traced in Mexico come from the United States. Both Mexico and the U.S. are aiming to strengthen controls against arms trafficking through an electronic tracking program, but specific details have not been provided. Trump raises $7.1 million after Georgia mug shot. Former President Trump's campaign has raised $7.1 million since his booking at Fulton County Jail, where he became the first U.S. president to have his mug shot taken. His fundraising efforts include selling merchandise featuring his mug shot and the phrase, Never Surrender. He raised $4.18 million in a single day, marking his highest-grossing campaign day so far. Over the past three weeks, his campaign has collected nearly $20 million. Trump's indictments in both federal and Fulton County cases have fueled his recent fundraising surge. He also returned to the platform formerly known as Twitter to share his mug shot and campaign website link after being reinstated following his initial ban. Ukrainian security services drones attack planes at Kursk airfield. On the night of August 26-27, Ukraine Security Service, SSU, military counterintelligence used 16 drones to strike Russian Su-30 and MiG-29 aircraft, along with S-300 and Panzer systems, at the Kursk airfield. The attack, reportedly organized by the SSU's 13th Main Directorate, targeted for Su-30 and 1 MiG-29 aircraft, as well as S-300 radars and two Panzers. Most of the drones successfully hit their targets, causing at least 13 recorded explosions. The aftermath of the attack is yet to be fully assessed. Earlier, Russians claimed a drone had crashed into a residential building in Kursk without causing injuries. Official New Ukrainian-made missile used to strike Crimea. On August 23, a Ukrainian missile strike targeted a Russian S-400 air defense system in Crimea, specifically the Olenivka area. The strike utilized a new Ukrainian-made missile that functioned flawlessly, resulting in the destruction of the entire S-400 system, including personnel and missiles. The S-400 system, capable of targeting aerial, land, and sea-based targets up to 250 miles away, was wiped out. Ukrainian forces subsequently conducted a successful joint operation, involving the Navy and intelligence units, landing in Mayak, near Olenivka, and raising the Ukrainian flag. This operation was part of a broader, long-term effort against Russian targets, with several successful strikes carried out in Crimea over the summer, including an attack on the Crimean Bridge. Ukraine offensive to speed up as forces break through Russia's strongest line of defense. Ukrainian forces claimed to have breached Russia's strongest line of defense, potentially accelerating their advance. They are on the brink of capturing the village of Robotyne in the southern frontline sector, which could open the door to Russia's formidable defenses. The offensive is aided by Western-trained brigades, including those with British Challenger 2 tanks. 
The battle for Robotine has shown fierce gunfights in dense foliage, with artillery and drones used. However, the pace of the Ukrainian offensive has raised concerns among Western allies. Additionally, a tragic incident involved two Ukrainian jets colliding during training, resulting in the death of three pilots, including an experienced ace pilot known as Juice, who advocated for F-16 fighter jets for Ukraine. Ukraine investigates incident that killed three pilots. Ukrainian authorities are investigating a midair collision between two warplanes that killed three pilots during a combat mission in Ukraine's western Zydomir region. The collision involved two L-39 training military aircraft. Among the casualties was Andriy Pilshchaikov, known as Juice, who advocated for Ukraine to acquire F-16 fighter jets. Russian forces launched cruise missiles targeting central and northern regions of Ukraine, with four missiles successfully intercepted by Ukrainian air defenses. Falling debris from intercepted missiles damaged homes and wounded two people in the Kiev region. Russia also claimed to have successfully hit an airfield in the Kiev region, which Ukrainian officials did not immediately comment on. In Russia, two drones allegedly launched by the Kiev regime were reported to have been brought down. Russia launches overnight air attack on northern, central Ukraine. Russia launched an overnight air attack against Ukraine, sending missiles over northern and central parts of the country. The Ukrainian military reported shooting down four cruise missiles out of a total of up to eight airborne targets detected, with the rest likely being false targets. There were no immediate reports of strikes, but two people were wounded and ten buildings damaged by falling missile debris in the Kiev region. All of Ukraine was under air raid alerts for about three hours before being cleared. Russia has been conducting regular airstrikes using missiles and drones against Ukrainian targets as part of its ongoing invasion. Meanwhile, Russia's defense ministry claimed to have shot down two drones in regions bordering Ukraine, stating that the regime in Kiev attempted terror attacks using drones on Russian targets. Russia deploys over 100,000 troops to Lyman and Kupiansk fronts. The Russian occupying forces have approximately 100,000 troops deployed on the Lyman and Kupiansk fronts and have increased the frequency of attacks. According to Ilya Yevlash, head of the press service for the Eastern Forces Grouping of the Ukrainian Armed Forces, the enemy has carried out 620 attacks on Ukrainian positions and 15 airstrikes as of August 26. About 45,000 Russian troops are on the Kupiansk front, and 48,000 are on the Lyman front. The UK Ministry of Defense has indicated that the Russian command is expected to intensify its offensive on these fronts in the coming months. Russian tech billionaire wants sanctions lifted after he criticized Ukraine invasion, report says. Russian oligarch Arkady Valas is formally requesting the European Union EU, to lift sanctions imposed on him after he publicly condemned Vladimir Putin's invasion of Ukraine. Valas, co-founder of Yandex, Russia's equivalent of Google, criticized the war as barbaric and expressed his opposition to it. He has been sanctioned by the EU due to his involvement in sectors that provide substantial revenue to Russia. The EU accused Yandex of promoting Russian propaganda and narratives in search results while suppressing critical content. The request by Valas's lawyers marks a test for how previously sanctioned oligarchs who denounce Putin's actions will be treated. The EU is expected to discuss the request next month. Australia concerned about China economy, monitoring very closely. Australian Treasurer Jim Chalmers expressed concern over signs of economic weakness in China and its potential impact on Australia's economy. He mentioned the softness and weakness in the Chinese economy in recent weeks and months, highlighting implications for Australia. The slowdown in China, driven by factors like a property slump, weak consumer spending, and reduced credit growth, prompted Chinese authorities to cut interest rates and promise further support. As China is Australia's top trading partner, Chalmers emphasized the need to monitor the situation closely, mentioning deflation, property sector concerns, and banking sector challenges in China. He also noted that Australia's economic growth could be substantially weaker due to China's slowdown and domestic interest rate hikes. China's industrial profits extend slump into seventh month. Profits for China's industrial firms experienced a 6.7% decline in July compared to the previous year, marking the seventh consecutive month of profit slump due to weak demand. The data, released by the National Bureau of Statistics, indicated a 15.5% decrease in earnings for the first seven months of the year, following a 16.8% drop in the first half. 
The decline was attributed to low commodity prices and eased pressure on raw material costs in various industries. State-owned enterprises faced a 20.3% earnings decrease, foreign firms saw a 12.4% decline, and private sector companies experienced a 10.7% fall. The industrial sector's challenges are driven by a worsening property market, weak consumer spending, and credit growth concerns. China's aggressive behavior in South China Sea must be challenged, U.S. Navy official. Vice Admiral Carl Thomas, the commander of the U.S. Navy's 7th Fleet, emphasized the need to challenge and counter China's aggressive behavior in the South China Sea. He specifically mentioned incidents like the use of water cannon by China's Coast Guard against a Philippine vessel. Thomas assured the Philippines of U.S. support in facing regional challenges, stating that U.S. forces are present in the area for a reason. The 7th Fleet, headquartered in Japan, operates with approximately 70 ships, over 150 aircraft, and more than 27,000 sailors. Thomas highlighted the importance of pushing back against activities that operate in a gray zone and encourage nations to stand up against such actions. He referred to a recent incident on August 5 when a Chinese Coast Guard ship used water cannon against a Philippine boat delivering supplies to troops. Thomas also engaged in discussions with Vice Admiral Alberto Carlos, head of the Philippine Western Command, to understand challenges and explore collaborative opportunities. The South China Sea remains a contentious area due to China's territorial claims, which overlap with the exclusive economic zones of several neighboring countries. East Asia's Seismic Shift, Why China Sees the Camp David Summit as the Start of a De Facto Military Alliance as the United States draws closer to a de facto military alliance with Japan and South Korea, concerns have arisen about the potential destabilizing impact on the regional power balance, particularly amid rising tensions between China and the U.S. While U.S. President Joe Biden emphasized that the recent trilateral summit between the three powers at Camp David was not targeted at Beijing, a joint statement expressed concerns about China's aggressive behavior in the South China Sea and its policies toward Taiwan. Chinese officials criticized the summit, viewing it as an attempt to sow discord between China and its neighbors. Experts suggest that the summit marks a de facto military alliance between the US, Japan, and South Korea without explicitly stating so. The leaders agreed to hold annual summits and joint military drills, establish a new military intelligence hotline, share data on North Korea's missile launches, and discuss measures to safeguard supply chains from China's influence. This strategic coordination indicates a shift in the East Asian security landscape and has been likened to a seismic change not seen in the region for a century. China's increasingly assertive actions have pushed Japan and South Korea closer to the U.S., with South Korea aligning itself more closely with the two countries on China-related issues. While the trilateral partnership is significant, experts caution that it could be influenced by domestic politics, especially as leadership changes occur in each country. China's strong-handed diplomacy with its neighbors has contributed to this situation and may have pushed Japan and South Korea closer to the U.S. The geopolitical situation is seen as increasingly divided into two camps reminiscent of a Cold War dynamic, with the U.S. and its allies on one side and China and other authoritarian regimes on the other. Overall, the trilateral partnership raises concerns about regional stability and the potential for increased tensions and conflicts, particularly in the Taiwan Strait and the South China Sea. The evolving dynamics in East Asia will depend on future political changes, economic developments, and strategic calculations made by all parties involved. Modi says India as G20 host will be inclusive and invites African Union to become permanent members. Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi has emphasized that as the host of the G20 summit this year, India's focus will be on highlighting the concerns of the developing world. Modi proposed that the African Union become a permanent member of the G20, aiming to address the urgent problems faced by developing countries and promote inclusiveness. During the Business 20 Summit in New Delhi, industry and policy leaders discussed various themes such as building resilient supply chains, digital transformation, debt distress in developing countries, and advancing climate change goals. Their recommendations will be shared with the G20 governments. India's role as the G20 host has been marked by efforts to bridge differences among member countries, particularly regarding the conflict in Ukraine. While consensus on Ukraine has been challenging to achieve, India has urged the G20 to address issues that disproportionately affect developing countries, including unsustainable debt levels, inflation, and climate change. A significant part of India's strategy involves inviting the African Union to join the G20, 
aiming to ensure that the concerns of the Global South are addressed within the forum. This move reflects India's commitment to promoting economic growth and development that takes into account the crucial concerns of developing nations. The three-day conference also saw participation from ministers and policymakers from other G20 countries, including China. China's Vice Commerce Minister Wang Shouwen mentioned that trade between China and India was growing fast, and India was welcome to join the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership RCEP, a China-centered Asian trade bloc formed last year. However, India's Minister of Commerce and Industry, Piyush Goyal, raised concerns about the trade deficit and questioned how China could supply goods at lower costs than raw material costs. India's trade deficit with China stood at $101.28 billion in 2022, according to official data. Iran says uranium enrichment continues based on domestic law. Iran's nuclear chief, Mohammad Aslami, has stated that Iran's uranium enrichment continues according to a strategic framework established by the country's parliament. Aslami's comments came in response to reports suggesting that Iran has slowed down its 60% uranium enrichment activities. Aslami clarified that Iran's nuclear enrichment activities are being conducted in accordance with a strategic framework law passed by Iran's parliament. This law was established in 2020 and requires Iran to take certain actions, including increasing uranium enrichment, if other parties to the 2015 nuclear deal do not comply with their commitments. The Wall Street Journal had recently reported that Iran had reduced the pace of accumulating near-weapons-grade enriched uranium and diluted part of its stockpile. These actions were seen as potential steps to ease tensions with the United States and reinvigorate broader discussions about Iran's nuclear program, since the US withdrew from the nuclear deal in 2018 and reimposed sanctions, Iran has gradually violated the nuclear limitations outlined in the agreement. In response to these developments, Iran began enriching uranium to 60% purity in 2021, bringing it closer to levels suitable for nuclear weapons development. However, Iran has consistently denied pursuing nuclear weapons. Nigeria's Tinubu to meet U.S. President at UN General Assembly Nigeria's President Bola Tinubu is set to meet U.S. President Joe Biden during the United Nations General Assembly in New York next month. The UN General Assembly is scheduled from September 18 to 26. Tinubu, who also chairs the regional bloc ECOWAS, has accepted the invitation, which was conveyed by U.S. Presidential Envoy Mali Fee. The meeting between the two leaders is expected to address the situation in Niger, where Tinubu is working with other West African heads of government to address the aftermath of a military junta seizing power. Tinubu, known for initiating significant reforms in Nigeria, is likely to discuss topics such as increased U.S. investment in Nigeria and enhanced cooperation for safeguarding democracy in West Africa, especially in light of rising coup incidents in the region.